Um, you all are here to, um, and we're here to talk about zoning changes for our core neighborhoods in, um, in Northampton. And um, my name is Carolyn Mish, I'm with the Office of Planning and Development. Wayne Feiden is here, the Planning Director. We have a couple, maybe one Planning Board member here, maybe more will show up. <laughs> um, but when, so this conversation about zoning is about the rules that frame allowances for development in the residential neighborhood. So we're talking um, primarily about um, um, lot sizes, uses allowed in residential districts, the setbacks and other changes that relate to how buildings are situated on parcels when, we're, when we refer to zoning. Carol, can I ask why is plenty more not here? We have two meetings. Um, we had two meetings scheduled. We had many planning board members last night, and another. So, and we have one planning board tonight, member tonight, and there may be others that filter in. So, uh, for eight members, I think probably now this makes seven total of planning board members that have been here. Um, so, um, tonight, what I want to do is talk about the process that has led us to this point. Uh, in the conversation about changes to our residential districts, um, what the goals are for the changes in the residential districts, review of the ordinances themselves and some details, go into some details, and then really open it up for informal question and answer and, and conversation. And so my about question them. would continue to be, why is not the planning board here? Um, again, the idea was we were having two meetings, and whatever schedule worked for planning board members, they would try to go to one or the other. I'm disappointed that they are not mostly here. Well, uh, I mean, I'm here, and the other planning board members were meeting last night. I mean, it's unfortunate that we can't all be here every night. The other meeting tomorrow night, okay. and, and you as a former city councilor know you can't be at every meeting, every night, in every place. So, seven were there last night, I'm here tonight, and we're all here tomorrow night. Okay. Feel free to come tomorrow. Would you introduce yourself, please? Oh, if you mind, Stephen Gilson, come on the planning board. Thank you. Um, so, it, um, to continue on, the the zoning changes that we're talking about are really for the core areas in Northampton: urban residential, what we refer to as urban residential A, um, B, and C. And they're really there's no um, standard reason why they're called A, B, and C. It's literally just sort of um, uh, an alphabetical <laughs> assignment of those districts. Um, but on this map, you can see here, this light green area is in the um, spots closer to um, center of Northampton. This is Leeds, is urban residential A. The lighter yellow here is um, urban residential B, which surrounds Florence Center. And into Bay State, the um, um, Ward Avenue neighborhood south of Elm Street and the areas north of Elm Street. Um, B also extends uh, along the Round Hill area for, um, for some parts and along South Street here and out um, Bridge Street and, and um, North Street. And then Urban Residential C is sort of this darker orange that surrounds um, the Central Business District, downtown Northampton. There are a couple of spots of urban residential C outside of this core area where there are some higher density apartments. Uh, we've got River Run condominiums, and um, along Barrett Street, we have some apartment buildings that are also urban residential C. Carolyn, can you tell, because these are the maps that we have, there's three of them. Can you tell me how and when and why they were created this way to look like puzzle pieces rather than? Areas. Yeah, and part of that I'll go into as the presentation um, continues, but um, historically, well, 1975 was sort of the, the 
1974 and 75 was when there was a major rezoning in the city, and that's when these districts were created. Um, they were much, they looked, um, in terms of the district boundaries, pretty similar. There have been some adjustment, adjustments to the district boundaries since 1975, um, but for the, for the most part, they're generally in the same um, configuration, and um, the characteristic or the lot size and, and dimensions required by zoning for each of those districts has changed pretty um, has changed pretty significantly since that time and over time. Um, but at any rate, that's before 1975. There was um, there were some. I think URA existed, urban residential A maybe existed before 1975, but there were many fewer districts and many fewer. Um, um, specific regulations for each district. Um, and just to go over the timeline again, I said there was a meeting last night and tonight is an informal um, public session. Um, and I'm going to go over some comments that were um, raised at last night's meeting so people here who weren't there last night can um, hear about um, comments that were made last night. Planning Board will take these comments uh, again, they're meeting Thursday this week, and uh, if and we'll spend as much time as they feel necessary to um, evaluate those comments, make changes, um, maybe uh, figure out what the next steps are. If those next steps are to introduce formally to city council an ordinance, or maybe revamp and um, then come back for a series of, of sessions, uh, public sessions. Once it gets once any ordinance gets introduced to council, it then gets referred out for um, official public hearing. In which case, several subcommittees of city council would evaluate and, and hold hearings or hold discussions about the specifics in the ordinance. And then those committees make recommendations back to the full city council. And ultimately, um, city council is the body that. Um, makes a decision about whether or not to adopt any um, new regulatory ordinances for the city. Um, comments going to the comments from last night. Um, there were there was quite a bit of discussion um, about the specific details of the ordinances. I listed um, some of the basic um, discussion items last night. There was discussion about whether the ordinance encourages walkability whether the ordinance might generate traffic on local streets, um, but reduce traffic overall on major streets, um, no, whether or not, I don't recall anybody saying anything about reducing traffic on major streets, no. on the contrary. Well, the, the, there was a discussion about um, the benefits of, of developing in, in a more sustainable way that really um, concentrates development on existing infrastructure, and the <laughs> results of that are that you would reduce traffic, generally traffic is reduced in the whole scheme of things, but there may be increases of traffic on local streets with, um, as opposed to pass-by trips from people coming from the outlying areas through neighborhoods. That was um, OPD's statement, not a comment uh, of others. I, among others, said that would think uh, not be Right, so there was a discussion back and forth. Um, we heard some folks talking about the benefits of having development in, in town and that being, the, the result being that there would be a reduction in overall traffic. I, do you have a record of, the, of uh, what we said last night? I definitely do not have a comment. I was there last night and I heard both sides speak. I heard both sides. So I didn't hear the same thing that would reduce traffic on major roads. That was one of the statements that some of the people had made. Yes. I mean, I, I'm sure I'll hear the part of that. Part. So there was a discussion about uh, the need for different housing options, choices of um, for people who want to downsize and stay in their homes. Um, there were there was a discussion about whether the zoning would create an incentive to reuse historic reuse historic buildings or. On the contrary, would it encourage demolition of those historic structures and reconstruction of those lots? Um, and then quite a few people you know, were concerned about the process, what the process was, whether or not it would, um, whether there would be a, 
public, um, uh, a citywide referendum or a vote on the ordinances versus going um, to city council. Um, we certainly heard a lot about design and that design is important um, in terms of new construction and, and additions as well. There was debate on whether the changes would result in impacts to community character and changes to community character and also whether it might spur people to move away from the center of town if they felt like they were having there were big impacts um, to their neighborhoods. Um, and conversation about whether or not rules should apply to differently to people um, on a case-by-case -case basis for approval or if they should apply the same across the board no matter what the situation is. Oh, there's also discussion about the interest in uh, making sure the city continues and uh, improving pedestrian facilities and the fact that we haven't done such a potentially such a good job of maintaining sidewalks and um, bicycle facilities in the city. And finally, there was some comment about um, the complicated nature of the ordinance and is, if there was a way to make it um, simpler for people to understand and read and, and absorb. In terms of the process for um, where we got to today, going back even further, um, going back to 2005, we had a sustainable development um, uh, process that was a kickoff. So we had a series of three days of charrettes um, that, uh, where the initial discussion about sustainability, how sustainable we are, what can we do to improve that sustainability, uh, came and, and out of that process there were many um, um, recommendations about how we move forward and there was identification of um, housing um, components of how we can be more sustainable with our energy consumption, how we can be more sustainable in transportation, all sorts of um, aspects. That led to 2006 and 2007 Sustainable Northampton Plan and recommended uh, through that process is where we really heard that um, the, the needs for housing options to range the spectrum from not just subsidized affordable housing, but um, market rate ownership and rental housing, and that people really felt like it was important for the community to move in a way uh, for development to be focused on existing infrastructure so we can protect outlying areas and, um, and by that measure not consume so much um, land, both from an energy consumption as, as well as the land consumption perspective. At the end of that process, a, a committee was created, the Zoning Revisions Committee, that uh, was charged with taking on some of the recommendations out of the plan and, and putting forth actual um, zoning code changes that would help implement some of those goals that were identified in the plan. And the Zoning Revisions Committee acknowledged the um, neighborhoods that we all know and love, and the character is very important. And they were concerned with putting forth a, a recommendation on ordinance changes that would allow those neighborhoods to continue um, both to be replicated but also thrive in a way that provides a mix of uses and choices for people. And finally, in 2010, there was a, um, the Housing Partnership for the City uh, um, issued a, or had published a housing needs assessment and strategic plan that was done through a consulting services. And there were many details uh, in that plan about the needs um, for a whole range of, of housing options and really just dis, um, displayed the, um, the, the lack of options in the market. So that also plays into this um, history and discussion. Just to go over a few data points, population has been flat and or slightly declining since 1960, but more to the point with the people per household ha has dropped, and this is a na nationwide trend, um, but in Northampton specifically and citywide, we've dropped um, people per household from um, 
1980 to 2.1 in 2010. But in these neighborhoods that we're talking about, the urban residential A, B, and C, which make up the um, approximately two-thirds of the residential um, units in the city, the persons per household is much lower than the citywide number. So 1.86 for single-family structures and, and 1.8 um, um, for single-family and 1.6 for multifamily neighborhoods in and surrounding the downtown area. <coughs> Um, so what I have these numbers there to just point to the fact that over time we've had, we've gone from many more people in units and sort of a mix of units in town to, um, even though the population has been um, flat, the, the demand for units is, is spread out because it's not concentrated in, in, in one um, unit or one structure. So that's created a need for additional but smaller units because there are fewer people living in them. Uh, as it relates to sustainability, um, the issues that are um, tempted to be addressed here relate to um, the fact that existing our, our zoning now is out of sync with um, the way the historic neighborhoods were built prior to the 1940s. And um, the Zoning Revisions Committee went through and looked at the units in these neighborhoods and, and discovered that well over 60% of uh, single to three family units in urban residential C don't conform. Even higher numbers for multifamily in the urban residential B and C districts don't conform to or, or don't, um, aren't consistent and, and couldn't be built now under today's zoning standards. And what that means is that um, and, and I think the way that we got here, this question came up and we tried to answer it last night, it, um, is that in the 70s or prior to the 70s when the zoning was initially put into place, the model was more of a suburban type model um, where we wanted to, where the idea at that time was to segregate uses but for create high density clusters of um, affordable housing. So we got projects like um, Hampshire Heights and the other um, smaller apartment complexes um, around town and then the idea was then to develop um, so more segregated single-family homes elsewhere. Um, so this zoning is trying to address sort of going back to prior to the 1960s and 70s um, where when the city built out where there was a much, much greater mix of these type of units and so question over here. Uh, I, I, I think we rather go to the presentation and come back. We lost time for questions. Yeah. Well, where, where are your urban A statistics? This is B Right. So we have a, a less, a fewer number of um, single-family homes that are. I think it was around 30 or 40 percent of the single-family homes in urban residential A, and then of course all the two and three-family homes that exist in urban residential A. Um, are not, are, don't comply at all because we don't allow multifamily or two and three family units in urban residential land. Um, so the idea is to adjust the zoning to reflect those historic patterns of the neighborhoods that um, people know and love and thereby um, build close to goods and services where people can walk if they choose but also providing options so that you know we're not we're not telling people they have to walk um, or bicycle places, but it does give options. Um, again, so the goals would be to with this zoning would be to allow a modest number of new units, but enable again choice that reflects um, the existing character of the neighborhoods. Um, provide units, additional units that are accessible to infrastructure and create flexibility for family changes. Family sizes go up and they go down. People may want to stay in their units, but the structure becomes too large for them and they really don't want to move. This would allow flexibility for those situations. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about encouraging preservation of historic homes by allowing people to add units. We've had situations, um, I've had um, <coughs> people, realtors, as well as homeowners call and ask if um, they could add a unit or a house comes on the market and it's just 
oversized, so 3,000 square feet, and nobody wants, people don't want to buy for a single family home a 3,000 square foot building. Could they add another unit and, and thereby offset some of the costs it takes to maintain such a big structure or to even improve that structure? Um, the idea would be, so there's an example house here that is quite large and came on the market um, and it's representative of many such larger, older homes that really can't be carved up into other units because of the way the zoning is currently today. Um, we also are trying to simplify the ordinance and combine tables so that it's easier to read. You get most of your information in one piece or one document instead of trying to flip through multiple sections of the zoning ordinance so you can get a quick snapshot of what's allowed in each district. Um, again, um, the zoning would allow a modest amount of new units to recapture and, and replicate those neighborhoods. And the other um, piece of this was to introduce basic design standards for all residential units in these districts. We don't have any design criteria now for homes. So when you um, buy a lot, um, you can decide what kind of structure you want to put on that. It doesn't, you, there's no design review um, for that. And this would provide some basic standards that really seek to um, create a streetscape, a friendly streetscape that's consistent with what's in these neighborhoods. Um, currently and how it was built decades ago. A big change and shift in the zoning is really to base the number of units that are allowed on a minimum amount of open space per parcel and also provide adequate off-street parking. So it's not proposed, there's no proposal to change the number of parking spaces or to reduce the total number of parking spaces. Um, but we heard a lot through the process going back to 2005 and even before that, that open space within neighborhoods was important. So the idea is to really use that as a cap to the number of units. So you might, if you're a homeowner, desire to add two or three units in your house, but if you can't meet that minimum open space requirement because adding parking would then eat into that open space, then you might... Um, keep your home as, you might have to keep your home as it is and not be able to add those units. But on the other hand, if you did have plenty of open space, it would give you some flexibility to potentially add units. Um, site plan approval would still be required for any construction other than a single family home that's greater than a 2,000 square foot expansion. So any multifamily that um, is or a proposal for a multifamily that would be more than 2,000 square feet, the planning board will review that for technical details, make sure that it, um, look at the character of that addition or that new structure. Um, so there is that review component. Um, there are modest changes in the open space minimums, not in urban residential C, but A and B. Um, and then some changes to the allowed uses. The planning board really looked at line by line through the zoning, what changes, what, what uses don't make sense. Um, currently, junk cars, for example, are allowed in residential districts, and the board felt like probably not a good idea in residential districts to allow junk car lots. Um, finally, there are no boundary changes proposed in this set of ordinances. Um, we heard a lot about concern about swapping, going from one district to another, so those boundary lines would stay the same as proposed. So I'll go into a little bit um, more detail about Urban Residential A. Um, as I mentioned before, that, so now just the green highlight, it's not showing up too dark up on the screen, but I'll just circle this. This is actually Look Park, um, but this area is Leeds, and we've got a little bit um, along Spring Street here, and then north of Florence Center, Foxhorns Road, Strawberry Hill um, area, and then north of Prospect. This is um, around um, the hospital and Child's Park. Um, and then a few sprinkles of A um, along Ward Avenue here and, and round, or Langworthy, Roundhold neighborhood. There's a, a change in lot size again to reflect the existing character of the urban residential A districts. 
um, lot size of 5,000 square feet, uh, 50 feet of frontage, and 40% open space. Right now, it's 60% open space, and again, it's sort of more that suburban model where you um, have larger lots and then you have lots of open space. So you're spreading out your development right, to a much greater extent than if you were um, thinking about um, ways to um, contain that growth and focus it on existing infrastructure. No changes to the number of units allowed in the urban residential area. We've heard that. Um, We've heard that several times over the years that people are concerned about going um, from single family homes to then allowing two and three families. So the two and three families that exist in urban residential A would be, continue to be grandfathered. And, and I just want to go into a couple of examples, or one example anyway, um, to sort of talk about what this might look like. This neighborhood is ex existing neighborhood in Northampton, it's Ridgewood Terrace. Um, street here, you can see a little bit of the Jackson Street School here. All these lots are 50 foot frontage lots here and al along here except for this lot here. Um, they range from 5,500 square feet to 7,000 square feet. Um, it looks from just quick look, it looks at least maybe 50% open space on the backyards of these of these lots. But so this is, this is potentially what it could look like, and what it would mean is there would be no changes along this street frontage, but there's a little parcel here on, this is Blackberry Lane, that potentially could get, you know, one more single family home on that parcel. Um, so recognizing that, yes, this, these changes would allow some um, bit of potential new housing lots here. This is the bike path down here. But again, sort of from a sustainability perspective, we think that's um, an important thing to think about given the access to both Florence Center and downtown and schools and so forth via the bike path, via the sidewalks and um, other infrastructure that's in place. For urban residential B, some details. Change in lot size for single family homes right now, there's an 8,000 square foot minimum for a single family home. The proposal and for, and, and I should mention also that currently um, the way the zoning runs is that for every unit you need to almost double the amount of lot size that you have in order to put another unit on. So in urban residential B, for example, it's 8,000 square feet if you have a single family home, but if you want to do a two family, then you have to almost double that and have um, um, 12,000 uh, 12, square feet and thereafter it's 7,000 square feet per unit. So it really, you know, um, exponentially expands the lot size requirement just to add another unit. Um, so it would be, the, the ordinance would simplify things and have one basic standard for any number of units and up to three units, potentially four in urban residential B, that's certainly under um, discussion at this point, but right now we allow three families by special permit. Um, and a reduction, a, a modest reduction in open space from 50% to 40%. This urban residential B area um, is mostly surrounds Florence Center and um, along Elm Street area, all of Florence Bay State, um, south of Elm here towards downtown, um, again out North Street and South Street neighborhood. Um, So some examples of what this might look like, they're large homes, everybody knows these homes on Elm Street, enormous mansions built a long time ago, and you know they're single or two families in some cases, maybe some cases they've been converted to three, but you know this is an enormous structure for a single family or two families, so this might allow an additional unit or additional unit in a carriage house in the back. Um, this example came up on this um, South Street, um, or I'm sorry, Olive Street last night, so I just pulled the picture and I apologize for using you as a poster child. But I thought that it would be good for, as an example, to see what that means. So this is an existing home um, on Olive Street, and there's just, this would allow sort of if you carve off a new separate single family house, this is a gap in the streetscape essentially, so you'd be filling in, and I guess this picture doesn't quite show the rest of the street, but the houses are, um, you know, essentially 50 to 60 feet of frontage along that, along that corridor. 
um, in urban residential C, the details, again, surrounding um, downtown Northampton and then a few spots um, elsewhere. Change of lot size, uh, currently 6,000 square feet for a single family home. But again, the date, so the way we got to 3,000 square feet for minimum lot size is looking at the average in urban residential C of what the existing conditions are. We've got three, four, five units, even more units on, on some very small lots, even dropping below 3,000 square feet currently. So it's really to allow um, development and reflect what's on the ground today. Um, and open space would stay the same. And then in urban residential C particularly, the tables are adjusted to be much simpler to understand and read um, and not have different varying um, lot sizes or heights depending on how many units you decide to put in your structure, but it would just be everyone sort of follows the same rules. And again, open space is the limiting factor on whether or not you could add a unit. Um, examples of this include this is a structure, a place out off going out Bridge Street. Um, you know, there's a large um, sort of detached garage structure in the back. There's this site could definitely accommodate um, one or two potentially more units. There's plenty of parking and open space on the site, so the changes might allow that to happen there. Um, there's another example of sort of filling in a gap on a street. Um, <coughs> in urban residential C where you might get a, another structure in here where there are homes you can see down going to the end of the block and then this row housing here but then there's this large block here that currently is, is not developable. Um, so just to summarize before we go into question and answers, the, the goal is to encourage a sustainable way of developing and in, into the future reducing overall citywide traffic by concentrating development on that existing infrastructure where people can, can make some of their trips in, in a way other than getting in their car and, and um, going to the store or driving two miles to get to a store. Um, the idea is to continue to encourage and replicate those high value neighborhoods that are in town and um, reduce the pressure for um, building larger scale complexes to accommodate the market rate affordable units or even the subsidized affordable units and have those mixed throughout neighborhoods as they were historically where you've got single families next to four families and um, that mix we heard is valuable to people um, in the city. And we believe that this would encourage preservation of older homes as I said and um, preserve the character and mix within the neighborhoods. So with that, um, open it up for questions and conversation. Um, well, I think I, Wayne might have better history about sort of how we got to A originally. Um, I know I, A was on the books in the 70s, which is before <laughs> Wayne got here, but I think um, many, I, I would guess that a majority of the um, structures in urban residential A had been single family homes. And so when A was created in its sort of most um, current form in 75 that the idea was to keep that the way it was. So anything that had more than a single family was grandfather was just sort of carried forward over time. I, I don't know if that's an accurate yeah, assessment. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't here in the 70s, but I don't know the exact reason. I didn't mean, I didn't mean that. I just meant 05 forward. You said it's come up, you've heard a lot, and nobody can. Oh, oh, know, I see what you're saying. People don't want multi family A, and it seems to me that actually goes against everything you've been saying in terms of what you're trying to right. have yep. a sustainable. There's been a lot of debate about that, and there's certainly some pockets of A that are right next to the bike path or, you know, That's very close important. to downtown, right. Yeah. And I don't know what year it was, a couple of different times 
maybe 2003 to 2007 time frame, there were some proposals that came forward to rezone out of um, A and rezone it to B because these um, pockets were completely surrounded by urban residential B. And there just um, didn't seem to be political support for that for whatever reason. Carol mentioned early on that this isn't including any map changes now because you know the, the sustainable plan has lots of things that we should be implementing over the next 10 years. At this point, we're just looking at districts. There may be some areas which we rezone the city. That's a separate piece. So the focus here is saying URA, wherever it is, should remain single family homes because most of we've heard pretty strongly. There may be some pieces of A that should be rezoned to URB, but we haven't looked at that yet. Um, there's anybody that's not When you're talking about design and review, I mean, what I'm imagining in my zone is you are in, and you're allowing two or three, uh, maybe even four apartments, depending on the open space uh, potential. Um, you know, I'm kind of envisioning second egresses, which are going to be necessary for each apartment. And I'm imagining, you know, doors opening up on second floors and odd spaces. Uh, you know, fire escapes coming off the doors, and I'm just wondering how is that going to, you know, what kind of design review are you putting in place so that these things don't happen and the character of the neighborhood is retained and property values are uh, maintained? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting. We've had, um, we certainly, th these, these basic design parameters that are proposed are really address the front of how the, the how the structure addresses the street. Um, so it, they don't go into the level of detail of what you might have in the rear or on the, along the side. Frankly, I think it may be a good time to start thinking about overall design for structures, but um, we, it, I think that takes a really long time because you need to think about what's in Important and what makes those what um, what would trigger design um, review or design standards? What they would be and what they're based on? What's what's the integrity that you're trying to maintain? And frankly, we haven't had an interest in going into detailed design standards. People, um, it's a complicated process to create design standards for every single residential district. I think this is a first step to look at. How does it affect everyone in a neighborhood on the street? You know, if you're going down the street, then the front is the primary thing that you see. So that, that's what, this is sort of a first step. And maybe the second step, another incremental step, would be to look at the whole envelope. But at this point, um, as a first step, that's what is proposed. Anything else that came up last night? Last night there was some discussion with people saying, oh, we should create this flexibility by having a process for the zoning board, or the planning board, to allow more units that's a case-by-case -case review for the process. And, and so there's an essential sort of fairness issue from the standpoint, is that if everything's case-by-case, -case, then the rules that apply to one person might not be the same rules that apply to, every, to somebody else. And so that's why we try to create you know, try to move towards having a, a, basically a set of universal standards within the zoning district. That said, because all these things require site plan approval, part of the criteria that the planning board looks at for site plan approval is the character of the area. How does it fit in? And, and the essential rule for site plan approval is the planning board can't say no. If someone comes in for a two-family home and a neighbor that allows two-family homes, the planning board has to allow the two-family home. They can, however, condition it to talk about, well, you need more trees to buffer that, or you need your fire escape to be different, you know, to look differently to be in a different place. So, so the idea of site plan approval is the use is allowed by right, people can go to the bank and know that, but those details are what we worked out with the neighborhood. So there will be something in place to prevent that Right, so they have to go before the planning board. The, the specific standards that we're written right now is about front, front facade and how far city council wants to go in the future on design standards, I think will be a discussion with the community. Karen, what is there a design standard now? Where is it historic house with fronts on Dryad's Green and backs on Kensington Avenue that's being made into a great family? And the fire escapes or the entrance is very much on. That's really ugly and disgusting to do with Kensington Avenue. I don't know how that got through. 
There are no design standards except in the historic district, so on, along Elm Street. Um, and then um, a, a little bit beyond that where the, where, where the district has um, been modified. Uh, and then for central business, but not in any of the residential districts. There are no design standards at all. Well, I mean, it's it's up for debate. Some people believe that's the case, and then other, you know, we, we haven't gone there because there's not. I don't think there's unanimity about, you know, how we address it. And I think it's a good question for the historic um, commission to evaluate. This may have been the question that this woman over there asked previously about URA. Um, why is it that URA isn't allowed? have more than one family unit? Um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's the same question. I don't know why. I think at this point we heard through the years that um, people who lived in URA were very concerned about allowing two families or allowing three families. So we haven't, um, we felt like it was more important to address um, other changes, dimensional changes in the urban residential aid district that would allow some uh, some amount of new um, housing on sort of leftover pieces of land that were single family homes, if that is to be the case. But I don't, I can't answer you as to why it never was changed. But I'm telling you now, the reason why we haven't introduced it is because that's what we've heard through this process as people are concerned about. But it seems to me that as you listen to us talk mm -hmm. about URB and URC, that we could mount the same defense yes. and in light of that's what true. your sustainability principles are, it sounds like, well, we're going to apply them to B and C, but not to A. Right. Okay. That's true. And is it possible to get the uh, 2010 Housing Needs Assessment and Strategic Plan is that available online? Yes, it is. It's under our plans. Um, so if you go to the Office of Planning and Development website on the under plans, vision and plans, there's a, a link there um, to the um, strategic plan, to the housing plan. And who developed this strategic plan? Well, it was the housing partnership um, hired a consultant. Um, uh, okay. like, Karen Sooner Barn. Yeah, I'd like to add my voice to the group of people that have already expressed concern about traffic. Um, I live in Ward 3, and, and um, some of the small streets in my neighborhood have had traffic counts in the last few years, and they've ranged from 1,200 cars per day to 2,500 cars on streets like Williams and, and Holly Street and so forth. And you know, and you mentioned earlier that the number of, of, of per household has decreased, but the number of cars has increased. And I guess um, I'm really concerned about. I can oh, I can understand that you know this, this plan would reduce traffic to the periphery because there'd be more development in town, but in these core areas close to the downtown, it seems like we're already suffering from. A, a high volume of traffic, and B, a number of trouble spots where people go way too fast, and we're trying to calm that down. And I'm trying to figure out how this is going to help address those if there's going to be more cars and more trips in that downtown area. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the things that we um, don't know about some of that traffic is where it's, from where it's generated. So is it internal to the neighborhood, or is it people doing cut-throughs from elsewhere, you know, Amherst to get to some other place on the other side of Northampton. Um, but the the idea is that, you know, if, let's take William Street, it's very walkable to downtown, and you could definitely cut some of your car trips um, out compared to if you were living further out on Ryan Road or um, some other place where you're definitely going to be getting in your car and driving to the other side, maybe through William Street to get to wherever you're going to go. So, How do you think people do that to cut down their car use? Well, I think it's providing opportunity and options. We're not saying you have you can't come with a car, but we're saying 
you're here and, and sometimes it's actually faster to go by bicycle or by walking than to get in, go onto Bridge Street and go around the block to stop and shop or what have you, you can get on the bike path. But, right. I, but it's not, the idea isn't to say, if you move here, you have to drop a car. I mean, we've also heard from folks that um, have, you know, their, their landlords and they know from their personal um, experiences that their tenants um, don't always tend to have cars or maybe they have one car instead of two cars in their units and they are walking and biking a lot. So it's not, a, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all, it's sort of just the idea is to provide enough opportunity and enough option so that um, there are a whole range of, of housing units and types and provides flexibility for the way people want to function in their home. Right. We know that a home on William Street generates a lot more trips per unit than a home on Sixth Street. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Is that just not get your study I'd like to see that. Uh, but if you add more units, you're going to have more cars. Not necessarily. But not no. necessarily? Not okay. well, I, mean, I think that there's a lot of, of desire to move downtown so that people don't have to own a vehicle. I live on Round Hill Road, over the top of a steep hill. Are you saying that people are going to move there to walk downtown? Some people when, when, may. Some. And I think that there's a difference between New York and New York. But, but I have a landlord in New York City, and I can tell you that most of my tenants do not own a vehicle. And they actually want to use the apartment they have for rent, even though they don't have to. But that reduces the growth of traffic because of the living But it doesn't increase the amount of traffic if I add another unit and find another tenant who doesn't have a car. If you had 100 units in the neighborhood, all 100 would have to not have cars in well, order to cut down. But then there are commercial, you know, if they're living at five The number of Smith students is not increasing, but the number of Smith students calls is. I'm sorry, say it again. Have you thought about decoupling the increase in units with the number of spaces required to force fewer cars down in, in the new areas? Well, you know, there was a lot of discussion about, about that. And um, I think because we, because on the other side, people who live in um, closer to downtown were concerned that then there would be um, the street would be parked up with cars and then maybe that would be a problem during winter and so um, there's a balance of trying to ensure that um, during all seasons you know, we want to allow parking on the street but we also want to make sure that there's enough to accommodate off street so that was discussed I'm not sure um, we're Quite ready to be that sustainable, <laughs> um, but it's a good question. The city good doesn't require any parking spots in several business districts, in, in highway business, in central business, uh, in our industrial districts, um, because that's where it's, it's densest. In the other districts, there's a flat number, for as Carolyn said, because we're worried about people who are at, you know, they're not being enough parking spots for people parking the street. There is a process to the planning board to get a reduction in required parking spots. It's, the burden is then on the developer to show to the planning board that this person's paying the zip car program or there's a bus shelter right there, whatever it is, so the developer has to prove why there's fewer spaces. So it's not automatic in this part. Um, I went to a meeting last night and I, I heard the concerns about the traffic. And so I spent the day talking to all my friends who live outside of Northampton who would like to come in. And I spoke to um, 16 people who commute because they either work in Northampton and don't live in Northampton, or they have kids, and they have an average of four trips in and out per day for their kids. And they've all expressed, and they're all looking the same as, you know, I'm trying to de develop a single family home in URB, and can't right now um, because of the current regulations, but my space, when I would be able to do it, would be bigger than all ones on that street. And so I'm in favor of these moves. 
but at the same time, in, I'm in favor of the fact that all these people are making all these trips to bring their kids to the Northampton schools, whether it's between you know, Fort Hill, Smith Campus School, Bridge Street, all these people are in school choice, they're coming and making all these trips. And you know, they're, they're taking up a lot of the space. The systems, they're here, they have their cars, but they're not living here for the long term. And so that's going to be there no matter what proposal changes you make, because they're going to still bring their cars no matter where they're living. You know, as they're coming, but it's these outside people. I know so many people would love to live in Northampton, but can't. Are you saying that people moving outside Northampton are bringing their kids to school here? Absolutely. Year? My neighborhood, where yeah. I lived before in, Hol in Holyoke, um, six families bring their kids to some campus school or to Bridge Street or whatever, and they each make because they have multiple kids in different schools. They're making minimally an average of four trips. That's 64 between the 16 people I spoke to today. That's 64 cars in an hour. And, and the notion is that if they live on, say, uh, I'm trying to think of some I can't even name. Oh, Massasoit okay. Street and the kids go to the school, but they're not going to drive. They're going to walk through. From I mean, just regardless of weather, for instance. Um, in my neighborhood in Olive Street, mm -hmm. the kids all get together and parents walk their kids to, to school. When my, what's the distance? When my, from Olive Street to mine. That's, excuse me, I, I'm sorry. The, you're having a debate, and we're not having a discussion. I'm sorry. And I, no, you were doing fine. I mean, Mr. Green, I think you don't have to refute every point. I think everyone expresses their opinion, and it doesn't have to be countered. I mean, there's time for that, but I think it's important for as many people to get their, their viewpoints heard. Okay. No, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, people are very concerned, and uh, this uh, plan has a major impact on evaluation of property, and therefore it has a major impact on taxation. Mm -hmm. It does seem to me that uh, voting on a referendum would be a chance for everyone to feel enfranchised. And, and uh, also I'd like to mention, that the, uh, there's an elephant sitting in the room that people have seemed to have missed, and that's Opal. Opal is going to add 70 units. Now they're not all going to walk. I don't think half of them are going to walk. And so that, uh, it's, that's going to hurt traffic reduction. Go ahead. Uh, I, I might have missed it. Is there something you did with these changes that's going to encourage little um, pocket grocery stores in these neighborhoods? Um, this. Uh, no, in a nutshell. I mean, the, the idea is to essentially keep the uses allowed the same. So we don't allow commercial uses within the urban residential B district. There has been a discussion about creating um, a more defined nodes for um, commercial uses or in, in bigger developments, let's say a cluster or something to allow some amount of commercial uses. But this proposal does not um, allow any additional commercial use. But, but let me add, I mean, you know, all the studies are retail follows housing, not the other way around. So if, if you want to have little commercial grocery stores, you need to have a housing density get. We have, we have land that's zoned commercial where one could do a store and there's no market for doing it. So you need enough people to get to that point. You know, we, those of you who have been in our campus for a long time, 20 years ago, we have a lot more mom and pop grocery stores than we do now because of those market trends and sort of need the bodies to get those. So, do you think that this change would increase the density the mom and pop might follow? Well, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this change is not going to create a lot of units. It's going to create some, it's a good thing. So, by itself, would this do it? No, but it might help someone on the margin. You know, it certainly might help State Street Market be a little more successful. I don't really think you're going to sell something. Maybe that little gas station across from the Cooley Dickinson would start having more groceries. I don't think you'd really get a new grocery store given the number of units we could really be creating. Go ahead. Go back to that slide oh. that had you. I'm sorry. URC, and you were talking about, um, right, so there was this right change lot size. Oh, that's sorry. that one. Frontage, front side, and setback. Is, is that different <coughs> from URB? The front, the the, front um, and side piece, I didn't see that. Yeah, so, um, so in urban residential C, the current, actually in all three districts, 
we ha have the um, parameters about setbacks are all the same. So it's you're required to be 20 feet setback from your front lot line, 15 feet from both side lot lines, and 20 feet from the rear. In urban residential um, B, there's a pro there, this proposal would allow a, a reduction in front setback to 10 feet. So it addresses this the streetscape aspect, and that's really to reflect the existing conditions, and in fact, we have special permit and, or allowances to um, project into those front yard setbacks currently with porches, um, so this really sort of codifies the that 10-foot setback um, more firmly. In urban residential C, the proposal again is 10-foot front setback, and then a shift in the side setbacks to 10 feet because, uh, again, reflecting what the setbacks generally are in the urban residential C district. Um, and, uh, and in fact, many side setbacks in urban residential C are um, even less than that. So the existing conditions may be four or five feet. So it's, it just allows a little bit um, more allowance there. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I had two questions. One was about URA again. Uh -huh. and you know, you've obviously gone to effort to make URA quite similar to URB, except for the, the <coughs> unit, unit numbers. But why didn't you allow uh, zero lot line developments in URA also? Or it, did, I, did I read that incorrectly in the spreadsheet? Um, no. Um, you know, I think, um, well, the reduction in frontage, so a zero lot line uh, <laughs> setback, is a provision in um, B and C that allows the frontage to be reduced from the current 75 feet to 65 feet. If you own a large piece of property, you could divide it so you have two 65 foot frontages and then the shared or the new property line that you'd be creating um, where you have an ex potentially an existing house and then you're a new house, um, you could have less than a 15 foot side setback between that new property line. We've only over the, I think it was first introduced in these districts back in early 2000s, we've only allowed it in B and C, um, and I guess, um, I don't think there was any detailed conversation about why we wouldn't allow it in A, but I think the idea was that if we're reducing the frontage to 50 feet anyway, um, that that might um, address um, well, it's a the question need for makes it, it just seems to me that but, if you're making them functionally the same in terms of making lots available for construction, yeah. why not? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good anyway, point. That was yep. just my, and then, uh, um, then I have another question about home-based businesses. Uh -huh. And maybe I didn't come in at the beginning, maybe that was addressed, and I don't okay. know to what extent these revisions are changing that. I looked in the spreadsheet online and I couldn't really tell what was being changed and and uh, what was being uh, kept yeah. the same there. So there is actually a, a proposed um, mo a minor modification for the home-based business. Actually, it's based on, we just went through a whole change in the home um, business um, allowances, I guess, the last, what, what month are we? I don't know, spring or something, recently. Um, there's a minor change to that in these districts that would um, allow what we heard during the public hearing process was um, an interest in allowing um, personal service um, um, businesses that are appointment only, so not sort of thing where you're wide open for retail walk-ins and that kind of thing, but appointment only. That was that's the only tweak to the home business, but otherwise we made major changes in the sp spring. times during the presentation you said that this would result in a modest increase in the number of units, if I heard you correctly. And I guess I have a two-part question. What do you consider a modest number? Have you anticipated what the number of increase in units will be? And within which um, district? And how did you arrive at those estimates, yeah. if you did? We don't have an estimate of how many units it would be. The reason why we're talking about modest is that, again, it's 
it would be on a case-by-case -case basis if we reach open, you know, if someone wants to put a unit in their attic and they already have a two-family, they might be able to provide parking on site or they might not be able to add that attic unit because they're already at the 30% or 40% open space. So unless you went through and looked at all the open space for every single lot in the city, it would be impossible to gauge how many units. But I guess the idea is that, um, uh, so on that piece, and sort of um, infilling with or, or creating um, new units, that would be hard to gauge. In terms of looking overall, sort of from an aerial view and seeing how many new lots could be carved off, I think you know you could do a quick um, ballpark, you know, maybe 10, 20 units throughout B and C potentially over time. But I guess the idea is that we've never had our market has never had a huge influx of units at one time, and it and it really has been sort of steady, um, either up or down depending on the economy. So it's not. We don't anticipate that then the zoning changes would all of a sudden um, result in a lot of new units. Okay. The only thing I can say that's sort of similar is, you know, this, we've gone through other rounds of densification. The last one was about eight years ago or ten years ago. So, so the last big round was discussion about uh, allowing multifamily and some URAs, which that went down with in flames and had very little support for city council. That same package, though, had a lot of other densifications at the time, reducing the minimum lot size in URA, URB, URC, expanding URC district. And what we found from that is it led to a steady increase in number of, of units, but nothing dramatic. I'm, I'm not sure if I tracked it well enough to give you an answer, but it's probably been one or two new dwelling units per year over that last decade, which is a good thing. This might be a little bit more, but I don't think it's going to be dramatic. Well, when you understand the implication of what I think I just heard, you are proposing changes that will increase the number of units. It's a proposal, it's a plan. And you haven't done an analysis to determine what the potential population increase would be in these three areas. Well, po I mean, population increase is an easier answer to get, because we're having enough of a decline in population that we don't predict any increase in population. What, what we from today? From today. What we hope is to no stop... No increase in population going forward. What we hope is to stop the decrease in population in these areas. So if the goal is to get more people closer to downtown, we're losing it. We're going out. We've had this goal for 20 years, 30 years now, of having more people living next to downtown, and yet we have fewer people. You're here. talking numbers versus rates. Here's the question. Let, let, let me What's finish, the number let, let today, me first. and do you expect it to increase as a result of this? Okay. What I'm trying to answer is, in terms of population, no, we don't expect it to increase. In terms of units, yes, we expect it to increase. We can do projections. The problem comes that um, you can do a lot of different scenarios, and so we, we, we are going to do projections as this process goes forward, but it'd be really easy for everyone to shoot holes in them because we can say, okay, how many units really get demolished? How many times can people really assemble different parts of the land? And so there's lots of what ifs. So we'll be doing projections as it goes forward, but just to be clear, it's not an exact science because it involves so many different scenarios. It's easier to say how many units could you be getting over the next 100 years than it is over a shorter term. And so that's why the historical piece is in some ways easier to say you are, you are uh, A went from um, 20,000, I think, originally. What is that? 8,000? Um, uh, 8,000. Uh, no, it's 12,000. So. 12, yeah. so you are A went from 20,000 to 12,000. Um, and we have seen relatively few number of units coming in. So we can sort of project those things out. But it's not, you're not going to get an exact number because it depends too much on what the market is. One of the questions somebody had last night is, well, why wouldn't someone tear down a single-family home and build a four-family home? And, and, and one of the people in the audience who's done some investments said, because you, you never make a pick. You know, you tear down a perfectly good building, and you'd be in the property so much you couldn't make a pick. So, you could do a build-out that says what would happen if money was unlimited, but that's not the reality. So the reality becomes a little bit harder to track. Wayne, well, earlier you said there would be a modest increase in the number of units. Yeah. Uh, I know that we've never gotten around to defining the word modest, but the question I posed to you at the last night's meeting, this seems to be driven by the individual homeowner who wants to expand their residence from a uh, single in the single family to multiple. So there must be a backlog of requests for those. Out of the 11,880 households in these three zones, 
how many requests do you really have that are driving this significant change? So the issue is, this goes back to the people who talked about having friends from other towns who want to move here. That's the part that's really hard to quantify, is what's the pent-up demand that's out there. Most people talk to a builder or talk to their lawyer and read the zoning and say, oh, I can't build this. And so we never hear from them. So we know the people who come to talk to us, and, and several of them are in the audience now. But we don't know is the people who never talk to us. We know, hypothetically, a lot of people want to tell us they want to move to Northampton, and they tell us there's not a lot of units in town. We know if you talk to people who moved to East Hampton or Greenfield recently, that a lot of them looked in Northampton and couldn't find it. But because many people never talk to us, the zone doesn't allow it, we just don't have that number. That's why I was saying we can do projections. Right. If it's a homeowner, right. existing homeowner. Right. I mean, you must have an estimate of how many homeowners are coming in that I want to do with my property. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> over the years, I, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, but I think the other the other piece of it, though, is it goes back to the number of people that we don't know about specifically because, you know, the realtors know the market or they know the zoning and they know that certain things can't happen and they say, you know, when's the zoning going to change or other people come and say, when's this going to change? But the other piece of it is going back to the, the whole plan process, sustainable Northampton plan. And as a community, we said, you know, we know that there's pent up demand. It's not just for the people who, you know, want to have a huge home and then make some extra money by putting another unit, but it's people who um, can't even get in. They, they might be grad students or they might have just, you know, started a job or business or what have you, whatever it is. They can't get into the market, and and um, um, we and as a community, we said, you know, we want to be accommodating. We want to provide choice to all these different people because we like the mix of our population, and we want it to main, be maintained. And um, so that is what really sort of set us on this path to rethink those 1960, 1970 zoning. Um, um, allotments and, and, and dimensions and so forth, mm -hmm. and think about how we love our community the way it was originally built, and how do we get back to that point that allows that mix. There's also one other point, there's also been discussion over the years about not creating an artificial scarcity of units, that when the regulations are so strict that people can't develop units, that the prices keep going up. And so we, we, you know, one of the things we hear over and over again is people wanted more affordable housing, some people say that's fine for subsidized units. A lot of people say we just want the market rate rents to be less. Um, and in fact, we have such a low vacancy rate and so few units available, this drives up the cost of certain types of housing. I'd like the price of cars to be less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you said 20 to 30. I'll, I'll triple it. Let's say it's 100 people want to do that. 100 people are driving a change that affects 28,000 people. No, oh, well, that's what I'm suggesting is we went through this sustainable Northampton plan process and we said as a community that we want to build in a more sustainable way and how do we do that? And we want new units to, to be built on existing infrastructure. So it's not just people who are calling and saying, I want to do a unit in my house or the local builder who says, I'm running out of lots, I need a new lot to build on. It's what, what was determined as a community conversation about where we want to be and what we want to look like and how we want to function in um, today's reality. Go ahead. I sort of have a process question. When you decided in URC that you were going to take the average lot size and that made everything 3,000 square feet and you wanted URC to reflect what's on the ground, I think you're imposing a, a homogeneity that really isn't there. And you know that I'm talking about Round Hill Road. And um, you know the potential for these zoning changes will make possible an incredible density. And it will definitely change the character of the So I know that Amherst is an entirely different community, but I own property in Amherst. There's 
those living here in Northampton. And I know that they have adopted a similar sustainable Amherst plan, and, and they changed their zoning a couple of years ago that in a way that allowed this more readily. And they are now in the process of hearing a lot of complaints, I think, from people who live in Amherst who have had bigger places built next to them or houses turned. And I, and I know it's a different market because there's the whole university thing going on. But one of the things they're considering, and I, this leads to my question, is has this been considered in the context of this zoning change? Um, they are considering making some of the changes apply only for owner-occupied properties. So it's not that a developer could come and buy a property and turn it into three units instead of one, but a, a property owner who lived in it could. And I wonder if, any, if there's been any discussion about that kind of thing. Um, no, I mean, I think it's a fairness issue and sort of looking at across the board and how you determine whether someone's a property owner or a developer and, um, you know, could you have secret swaps behind the scene and, you know, um, I, I just, I think that the issue has been, let's look at this broadly, let's look at, make it apply to, to the district and be consistent across the district. Just, you know, we, we do do that for accessory apartments, the so-called mother-in-law apartments. So we, we allow accessory apartments in every single family home in Northampton. Um, but one unit, either the single family home or the accessory apartment, has to be owner occupied. Um, and so certainly we've done that before. Um, is the fairness issue? It's certainly a hard issue to enforce. I think either one, you know, the enforcement we can live with, but it's certainly a challenge. But I, I you know, I want to be careful of not stigmatizing renters because sometimes there's an implication for that that renters are bad, evil people, and only when the, the owner is there. Work. And so I think that's been part of the process as well. If what we say is, you know, what Hampton's had for a long time, and it shifted a little bit, Peg might know the numbers better, but about 55% of our housing stock has been owner occupied, about 45% rental, and maybe a somewhat older figure. But, um, so that's a lot of rental units that, that's out there. So, you know, and it can work well. I think the rental units that we get the least number of problems with are the four unit, unit units. Um, and I think we want to encourage. As opposed to getting, as Carolyn said, this model in the 70s was creating big projects and we're trying not to do that. Wayne, how many units are owned by trusts? If you pretend your owner was not uh, really living in the unit. Yeah, it's a good question. We don't track that, but it's a very good question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But, uh, I just want to say, I'm assuming you say sustainability and you're talking about environmental sustainability and responding to what's going on climate change and, and the need to be less dependent on fossil fuels. And, but I'm really excited about the, the changes in that way uh -huh. because I feel like even though there are a lot of concerns that people have as individuals, I think we can work those out. But I think that I, that's what I love about Northampton is that we are a model and a leader for this whole nation in, in addressing these environmental needs and moving forward and showing it's possible to, to do something about that. Yeah, and that was the impetus of creating the Sustainable Northampton Plan and to integrate all those aspects, both because they are all interrelated, transportation, land use, environmental um, impacts, economic impacts. And I kind of wanted to speak for children right now. I'm a teacher. I teach young children. I just want to say there aren't any little children in the room, but they really need us to do something so that they will have Sorry, we can't hear over here what folks are saying. Yeah, she was just saying that um, um, making sure that we think about the children who aren't here and that, that um, in terms of an environmentally sustainable um, plan, that um, we should think about that in the long term future of the community and the ability for children to live in, in the community. Go ahead. I'm telling you Go ahead. Yeah, but the drive for infill and making it denser into the skin structures, is there any limitation on existing open space, farmland, or essentially kind of trying to, a restriction of developing 
um, land, land itself. Yeah. But th that's kind of balanced for this. You know, in, in the last 20 years, the city has purchased about 15% of the city of permanently protected open space. So part of it is saying, you know, the open space model 40 years ago was undeveloped land with the open space. Now the city has been active in preserving a lot of open space, particularly in the outlying areas, but also in the, in the urban areas as well. So that the idea is, you know, we want to make sure that the quality of life so that people who live in neighborhoods still have easy access to open space. But is there a restriction based for the property owners? I own a piece of land, but I'd be restricted from this new policy. Or could that be worked in as a compromise in order for the density? So, so, in, they go hand in so hand. there's two kinds of restrict, two kinds of open space. Within the, these districts, there's a minimum amount of open space required. That is, you know, green stuff that's unobstructed to the sky. On so each that's parcel. On a, on a parcel. Yeah. In URA, URB, and URC, we've largely rezoned so that those farmland, for the most part, like Smith Oak may still be part of this, but most of the farmland isn't part of this. So, mo so that, you know, there's special conservancy, which is all the farmland along the river, and water supply protection, water shed protection. So we're really not talking about significant amounts of open space in these urban quarters. That's why the meeting today is about your A, B, and C, right. like a separate discussion for outlying areas where we're getting stricter. Right. So, go ahead. Uh, I've owned land in Jackson City for 15 years, and it was a URB, and now it's a URC, and in the meantime, all these big uh, projects have grown up there. And uh, I'm a little worried about it because there is really no enforcement that you can really do. It's mostly by the honor roll. And I can tell you on Jackson Street what happened. The accessory apartments are by right, okay, but I didn't know where there was any specification. There's one person there who put a, a half a house and it was separate from the main house. There wasn't even a door going to that house that they could qualify it. So he put a board up on top where his door was. And, uh, okay, so now that's an accessory apartment because you're not a, you don't have the personnel to go around and watch all that. Then another person on Jackson Street saw that. So, okay, they built a whole house in the back. And they put a whole, just a roof over, a little longer roof over a walkway. Now, there's land on Barrett Street, there's land on Jackson Street. I'm worried about these things. There's another thing. A person next to us had a one-car detached garage, not 15 feet away from the line. Okay? He turned that into an apartment so he could rent his house. All these things didn't bother me because there's all this open space there. I own it and there are other people who own it. It didn't bother me, okay? Because I knew his circumstances, each time you know there's circumstances and you decide it, it's okay, you know, do it. He was old and he needed the money and all of that. Okay, so he ran up his apartment with that. Some friend came and connected the sewage and the water. They're all dead who did that, so you know what I mean? But this is going on. The other, on the, my other side, somebody decided he needed two more parking spaces. So he just goes out there and he takes a pick and he chops away at the asphalt. The asphalt curbing, and he has the two things. There is no way, I don't see how you can prevent this. I mean, it doesn't bother me. Uh, there's still lots of land there, but, uh, uh, and I understand why people did it, but uh, if it gets to be that people are crowding each other, this is going to be more of an issue. Yeah. Well, you know, enforcement is always an issue no matter what the ordinances are, and, and to a large extent, we do rely on folks to say, call up and say, hey, this doesn't look right, can you check it out? Um, because we don't have people going out looking for violations. Um, but what that happens, I mean, that's across the board, no matter what district we're talking about. Any other? Go ahead and then, Jim. Okay, just um, last night you mentioned about the declining population, so I did a little research on your website today. And, um, for the 40 years, from 1960 to 2000, the population has been declining. It's gone down just under 3% in those 40 years. But from 2000 to 2009, it's gone down 9%. So the last decade, for some reason, people are screaming out of Northampton, 
Now, I don't know if I'm in favor of these or opposed to them, <laughs> but I do like Northampton, and I would like to see my neighborhood uh, atmosphere maintained, so I would oppose a six-story Ramadi and being next door, or a trailer park, or heavier traffic, and all the things that people worry about. But I'm wondering if you're using a sledgehammer, changing the zoning in all three zones, to solve a problem that you really haven't analyzed, why have uh, 2,600 people fled Northampton in the last nine years? And I'm wondering, if it, is it because in 05 you did the SDAP, in 07 you did a plan, and 09 you did the zoning, and you've got these new zoning uh, needs assessment and strategic plan that you were. I'm wondering if we're changing the character of Northampton and people are saying, I'd rather not be in that. And I don't know the answer to that. I think they went to school. <laughs> I think they graduated. I think that. They went I to the that, going to I think that our population has gotten older, and that kids grow up and they go to school and they move away. And I think that's, but I, I think it's a worthy question to, to be asking. Um, I last night I I spoke and I I suggested this that. Uh, people take uh, these recommendations, bring them home, and walk your property, walk around your neighborhood, and look at what the actual impact might be. In a lot of cases, I, I think what you're going to see, it's not a big deal. Uh, there are going to be places where there will be opportunities to build. And, that, um, and I think that that's really what these dimensional changes are about. Where, where are those opportunities, and do we, do we want those things to happen in our neighborhood? Um, I, I, I think we, it's great everybody wants to bike or I'm not against people buying cars and using cars, you know. I think that, you know, it, you know that zoning is not going to change the world, but, um, but we can take these small incremental steps. And I, I, as part, somebody who was part of the Zoning Revisions Committee, I mean, to take all of this stuff and, you know, bikes and, and uh, the environment and turn it into a dimension, you know, on on a map, it's, it's kind of bizarre. And, and uh, um, the, the last thing I want to add is that um, that I, I have mixed feelings about the recommendations for URC. On the one hand, I look at it and I'm like, oh, that gives me some flexibility on my property. I could go and put, you know, a single family house on part of my property. At the same time, I know that my neighbor, Mac, might be thinking about putting a condo development in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, that there's consequences that spread out through our neighborhoods. And that, um, and the last thing, and I, I wrongly said something about the condo, that that was something the ZRC did not get to. We did not get to those types of developments, which actually, when we were holding our hearings in, in all of those hundred hours of meetings that we went to, uh, that uh, people were really concerned about the bigger projects. And, and I think that is, that's a whole other thing to talk about. Right now we're talking about what you can do, what your neighbor can do, what the person down the street can do. And that, um, so let's not get them all confused. <laughs> I'll take a couple more comments, I, you in the back, and then, oh, go ahead. Um, I just want to say I've, I've lived in this more than 35 years. And when I first moved here, most of my friends lived here too. A lot younger, 35 years ago. And um, uh, none of my friends live here anymore. And the reason they don't, they moved to East Hampton, they moved to Greenfield, they moved to Huntington, and they moved because they couldn't find affordable rentals. I was lucky enough that I was able to buy a house over in Graves Avenue. Um, but it was less expensive than they are now. Um, but I know many people who would like to live here, um, who, and they're not students, um, and they don't live here, and their kids, because we're all old enough to have grown children, their kids can't live in Northampton. They don't have the rental units. And now I guess I live in A, and I guess I have one of the only two families over there. It's actually a three family. We can't rent third floor because it's, it's illegal, I guess, because of these. We didn't put it in. It's the way we bought it. We have so many people who come to our house and go up there and go, we would love to live here. We would love to live here. 
can't rent them. Right? So I think there really is a need for rental units for people who either can't or don't want to buy a home, but want to live in downtown Northampton, and for the, the lucky parents whose children want to stay in Northampton, and then they can't find, you know, they can't find a place um, to stay. Thanks. Um, last comment, and then we'll wrap it up. And, and then actually, it's just a build on this, because I'm, I'm glad you said that. Because actually, there actually is documented evidence as to why the decrease in population is described. It's also commensurate with the state. The whole state is losing population. That's why we're reduced by one congressional district. But it's affordability is the major driver. It wasn't, it wasn't lack of appeal. And I'm not even saying that based on empirical observation. In fact, a lot of people, such as yourself, came to this community for the very reasons that we're trying to talk about protecting and defending this, what appeals to us about the community. And the thing that breaks a lot of our hearts is the fact that there are people who cherish this place as much as we do, or desire to live in this place as much as we do, and they cannot. And that actually is a loss to the community in May. If we lose affordability, if we lose a dimension of the population that's critical that defines us beyond the streetscapes and everything else, if there's no affordable places to live, we've lost a portion of our soul more than just our aesthetic. And I think that's really, that decrease in population that you know really does concern me. Because I, it represents something that I consider somewhat an aspect of a failure of this community. So what's the um, aging population in Northampton? I mean, is it like 55 and older, or is it 20%? Or, and it's, how change, is it's changing, and I don't, I can't give you precise numbers. And how I, is this all going to affect, say, an older person? I, well, I can, I can bike and walk, but I'm, in five and ten years, I'm not going to be able to. I'm going to have to get in my car and go. And if the aging baby boomers are this big glut of people in Northampton, we're going to have to drive our cars. We can't walk down the sidewalks on the ice. And I, th I think that's a very important consideration. Right. And also, for the, it's also the, it also speaks to the affordability issue. People on fixed right. incomes who have now paid out their mortgage that was $60,000 is now are now paying taxes and tax rates that are not sustainable. And they're being driven from here. And and this is ever so, of course. I mean, you look at it as an asset if you want to look at it really coldly. And then it also accounts for the turnover in population as well. And you're right, the baby boomers actually account for a great many people here. As we age out, and I am in the baby boomer much, as we age out, we become a burden on some level because we actually are requiring a younger cohort to sustain us. Mm -hmm. And we have to, I, I think we really have to do, it's incumbent upon us to lay the framework and the, and the groundwork and the infrastructure to sustain ourselves and to provide for that sustainability so that it, that burden isn't borne by people who can't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last one and then let's wrap it up so we can get to Yep, go ahead. Um, my name is Jerry Budger. I'm president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. And there's a couple of things that I would like to uh, mention. We had a board meeting last night, and this issue came up for a brief conversation. There's a couple of things that we've done over the years that I think are appropriate to mention at this point. A couple of years ago, we wrote a letter to the planning board, to the city council, to folks in city government, saying that there's a need for the city to do a much better job of notification of property owners when zoning changes are being proposed. And I want to renew that call. I think what we see in this package is completely inadequate. It doesn't tell us what the changes are going from and to on dimensions and a bunch of other things. I think there's a need for an enormous amount of outreach on this. This is the largest, most comprehensive package of zoning proposals I've seen come down the pike in a long time, and they have the potential to have enormous changes on the city. My ward includes a lot of URC, um, and it's, it's an area that is going to be significantly impacted, as are all of the downtown wards. And at our meeting yesterday, a number of our directors, some of whom are sitting here, said that they are concerned that there's an equity issue that ward, that URA is treated very differently than URB and URC. And the fact that when we're talking about sustainability and all 
of the need for affordable housing and the need for all kinds of things to change, URA almost gets a pass. URB and URC are taking the brunt of the, of the densification issue, and we think it's important that there be greater equity throughout the entire process and throughout all the districts. Thirdly, um, my board has authorized me to ask that a, a subsequent form be set up in Ward 3 for our folks, where hopefully somebody from the planning department, in conjunction with our counselor and people on the planning board, will come and do an open form for all of the people in our ward who have a chance to have everything laid out to them, talk to them about what the impacts will be on their neighborhood, and give them a chance to ask, ask questions, just as they've done tonight. But with far more advertising, we have a large list serve, our council has a list serve, we will get people to come to it. We think it's incredibly important that this propose, these proposals be brought to the public before there's any voting on them, and that people have an opportunity to have their say on them before the city council votes on it. Thank you. You can absolutely have a meeting. And uh, as you know, this was um, sent out to the War Three Association mm -hmm. through and your ward counselor. So. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, we appreciate all the comments, and like I said, the planning board is going to be working on um, further on this.